Once far from God and dead in sin, no light. Welcome to Searching the Scriptures, presented by The Church of Christ. Your speaker is Brother James D. MacDonald, Evangelist. We ask you to get your Bibles and study along with Brother MacDonald. Join us now for today's program as we present Brother James D. MacDonald. These are more noble than those in Thessalonica that with all readiness of mind they searched the Scriptures daily to see whether the things taught were so. Acts 17 and verse 11. Greetings, friends, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and Him crucified. We welcome you to the Searching the Scriptures telecast. We're so thankful after an absence of about 15 years to be back here on WDKY Channel 56 here in Lexington, Kentucky. We're so thrilled and so excited and we're just amazed at the opportunity we have to proclaim the unsearchable riches of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and Him crucified. We appreciate the management of this station, their kindness and their hospitality and their help along the way to produce these programs to the very best of their ability and we intend to work together now for many years, the Lord willing. We ask that you as Christians pray for us that we'll have the insight and the foresight to preach and proclaim God's holy word without compromise, not adding to, nor taking from. Revelation 22, 18 and 19 warns us if we add to this book, we'll add the plagues written this book to our lives. If we take away, we'll take our part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things that are written in this book. Deuteronomy 4, 2 in the Old Testament warns not to add to nor diminish aught. Of course, the word diminish means subtract from, and so we're not to add to nor take from God's Word. The Old Testament warns us not to do that. The New Testament warns us not to do that. We've been warned and we've been taught. Now it's up to us to make wise, intelligent, prudent choices and do what God's Word says to do. No wonder the Apostle Paul said in 2 Timothy 2.15, steady, that's a command, not an option, steady to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that did it not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now when we rightly divide the word of truth, we handle it aright. We understand the different ages and periods of time in the Bible. There are three distinct periods of time, the patriarchal age of Bible history, the beginning age of time. Patria means father and archal means rule. It was the age, the time of the father's rule. When God spoke orally and verbally and directly to man, there was no written revelation during this period of time. Now notice I didn't say there wasn't any revelation. I said no written revelation, no recorded revelation that we have record of. Then of course, under the, uh, the law of Moses, the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ, John 1:17. This period lasted about 1,500 years of time as compared to the patriarchal age, 2,500 years of time. And during the Mosaic age of time was recorded the first written recorded revelation that's written down for us to study from, and that's the Ten Commandments written on tables of stone. And then, of course, since the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus from the dead, we've been under the law of Christ bear you one of those burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ, says the Bible. And so we've been here in the Christian age or dispensation of time. We're now in 2012. And so there's been an overview of about a little over 6,000 years since the beginning of time. And we must learn to rightly divide the word of truth. If we don't, we wrongly divide it, we misapply it, take it out of context and Peter said we rest or twist or pervert the Scriptures to our own destruction. So it's so important, it's imperative that we teach only what the Bible says, the way it intends to be said, and not add to nor take from God's Holy Word. We're not here on this broadcast, the Searching the Scriptures program, to beg and plead for your money out there in the viewing audience. This program will be presented by the Church of Christ, by people giving upon the first day of the week as they have been prospered according to 1 Corinthians 16, verses 1 and 2. Paul says, I've given an order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye, that upon the first day of the week 
that every one of you lay by him in stores, God has prospered him, and there will be no gatherings when I come. When Christians give on the first day of the week, as the Bible teaches, the funds will be there to do whatever we need to do in the work of the Lord according to the Scriptures. We must always make sure we teach the Scriptures. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All Scripture is given by the inspiration of God. Now what does that word inspiration mean? It means God breathed. It means heaven sent. God's guarantee is in back of every single word in the Bible. The dotting of every I, the crossing of every T is inspired. I believe in the verbal inspiration of the Bible. Neighbors and friends, brothers and sisters in Christ, ladies and gentlemen, don't you? We better believe it or that's a sad choice if we turn a negative ear to the Word of God Almighty. We're going to be judged by the Bible in the last day. Why should we waste our time and fool around with something in this present day that is not according to the Bible? If he's going to take an exam in college or high school and your grade was going to depend upon the, what you made on the exam, wouldn't you want to study the material that the exam had, had covered? Well, of course you would. You'd study the source. We've heard the expression many times, when all else fails, read and study and obey the Bible. And that's what we are to do. And we'll take our final exam when we stand before the great judgment seat of Christ. Jesus said in John 12, 48, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my word hath one that judgeth them. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. Now notice, when's the judgment going to be? Jesus said, in the last day. John 5, 22, For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment to his Son. Do we know why he's done that? Matthew 28, 18 through 20. All power hath been given unto me, both in heaven and on earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things which I have commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the world. And Jesus said in Mark 16, 15, and 16, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. And so the Bible makes it crystal clear what we are told to do. We just need to yield to His will. We need not try to tear down or take away from what the Bible says. Remember what we quoted earlier? Don't add to. Don't take from. Study. Meditate and ponder. All Scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly or thoroughly furnished unto all our every good work. 2 Timothy 4, 2, preach the Word. He didn't say preach your opinions, preach your education, or preach your IQ. He said preach the Word. Be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long-suffering and doctrine. God takes care through His Word of the reproving, the rebuking, and the exhortation. If we just have the backbone to tell it like it is and say if the shoe fits, wear it, and if you can't stand the heat, get out of the kitchen, and just move on up closer to God's Word, because that's what we need to do. If God says it, that settles it, and we ought to believe it, and faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God, Romans 10 and verse 17. Hebrews 11, 6, For without faith it is impossible to please Him, for all that come to God must believe that He is, and that He is reward of them that diligently seek Him. Now, when you diligently seek God, how do you seek Him? What is your attitude and frame of mind? You seek Him with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, that is, your total being. Matthew 22, 37 is a total commentary on it. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. Now, when we get to the point we do that, we're a real Christian. We're really following what the Bible says to do. We love God and Christ, the truth, and the church, more than we love our own bodies, our own lives, the things here in this life that are so temporary. You know, the Bible says the things which are seen are temporal. The things which are unseen are eternal. Think, neighbors and friends, how many things we can see. Then think how many we cannot see. 
Now, the King Eternal, the only wise, immortal, invisible God, to Him be glory both now and forever. Amen. Well, God's invisible. We can't see God with, our, with the human eye. Well, somebody said, I saw God go across the foot of my bed last night. Well, are we going to believe their testimony or the Bible? John 1, 18 says, no man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, He hath declared Him. Christ has declared, made God known, accessible and available through His death, His burial and resurrection, exaltation, coronation, and magnification at God's own right hand. That's a wonderful thing just to think about. And we know God through faith. We can't see Him with the eye because He's invisible, the Bible says. Well, I've never seen anything invisible, have you? And God is a spirit. And they that worship Him must, that's the imperative word, must worship Him in spirit and in truth. And Jesus said, a spirit hath not flesh and bones as you see me have. So that does away the human body, doesn't it? God is not a human body as we are. God is a spirit. God is in the spirit world. Jesus is in the spirit world. The devil is in the spirit world. But they have great impact here in our world. And so we need to yield our will to God's will, the superiority of divinity and deity and holiness is what we're talking about, God the Father. God the Word and God the Holy Ghost is referred to before the incarnation of Christ in the human body. Then he's referred to the Son of God. And his name is called Jesus. His name is called Emmanuel. In being interpreted means God with us. And he's, he is the Savior. He's Lord. He's Master. He's Redeemer. He's High Priest. He's King. And back to the point he will soon be our judge when he comes again. He's uniquely qualified in all these categories. Any other category, you might want to list him because he's perfect. He has total humility. He never disobeyed his father. He always submitted his will to God's will. Even in the Garden of Gethsemane when he knew that his death was imminent, it was coming upon him, he prayed, Oh, my father, if it be possible, let this cup that is suffering, anguish, agony, terror and horror of the cross. If it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thy will. Thy will be done, in other words, and not mine. And so, as Paul Harvey would say, we know the rest of the story, don't we? He went to Calvary. He suffered. He bled. He died. He was buried. He arose again the third day, according to the Scriptures, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4 chronicles that event very capably. And so just teach the Bible and follow the Bible. That's all we're interested in here on the Search in the Scriptures broadcast. And if you have questions about anything that we teach or anything we have not taught on, we'd be glad for you to write us at the address will be given at the close of our study from God's Word. And the Lord willing, being our helper, will give you a Bible answer for your Bible question. Of course, the Bible says foolish and unlearned questions avoid, and that's what we will do. We'll follow the Bible in that realm also. So we need to recognize then the importance of following only the Bible and doing what the Bible says. And sometimes, you know, people, when they're picking at you, they try to pick you apart. And I can usually determine that by the way they ask their questions and their attitude and actions. And sometimes they'll say to me, well, Brother MacDonald, where did Cain get his wife? And I determine whether they were trying to trap me or whether they want to know the truth. If they're trying to trap me, I say, well, he got her at his father-in-law's house. Where else? But then if he's really serious, I go into a, a dissertation of what I believe the Bible teaches to explain that. But we need to be ready to learn God's Word. Uh, see then that you walk circumspectly, the Bible says, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time. That is, buying up all your opportunities. That's Ephesians 5, 15, and 16. See that, that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, towing the mark following the straight and narrow, redeeming the time. He said the days are evil. Redeeming the time for the days are evil. And so we need to redeem the time. We need to buy up all of our opportunities and lest they slip through our fingers and pass away forever. Every second and moment of life is studied with diamonds, pearls, gold, and silver, and more valuable things than that. But I relate that to you because that's the greatest thing we can think about in this life. But 
God's Word is more precious than gold. The Bible says the trial of your faith is more precious than gold. So don't be frowning and, and don't be whining when you're tried and tested because that's God's checking you out to see what kind of material you're made out of. If you'll stand with the truth or you'll cave in and compromise to popularity, you see. So we've got to stand for the truth. And the Bible says, having all stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, Ephesians chapter 6, about verses 10 through 18. And he says, have your feet shod the preparation of the gospel of peace. And he says, put on the helmet of salvation, taking the soul of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. So we have all of this spiritual armor to put on to fight against Satan and the wiles of the devil. 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober, be vigilant, the word sober means level-headed, good judgment, good decision-making process, understanding and comprehension. Be sober, be vigilant, watchful, alert, always on guard, on top of things, taking nothing for granted. Why be sober? Why be vigilant? Well, he says, for your adversary. What does that mean? It means your greatest opponent, your greatest enemy, your greatest opposition. He'll destroy your soul. Be sober, be vigilant, for your adversary the devil walketh about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Devour, another word for destroy, do away with. He's able to do that if we make the wrong choices, like Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, like multitudes from that point forward. And that's why Jesus had to go to Calvary to die for the sins of the world. Man had eternal life in the beginning. He had immortality, but he left it all, you see. He lost it in the Garden of Eden but he regains it in the spiritual Eden, that place that we call heaven, because we'll be there in the midst of the paradise of God and have access to the tree of life. That is, if we're overcomers, you see, overcomers. We've got to be an overcomer. We've got to be winners. We've got to be champions. We've got to want to desire. We've got to have that hunger and thirsting after righteousness. Matthew 5, 6, blessed are they. It means a happy occasion that do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Now, when we sit down at the table and there's all kinds of food, we've got to take it in and digest it and absorb it in our bodies before we get any benefit from it. We enjoy while we're eating it. We enjoy the taste, but then the fruits afterward are that we gain strength from it that we never believed possible, you see. So we've got to drink in God's Word. The Psalmist David said, as the heart, that's a young deer, panteth after the water brook, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. Imagine a young deer galloping across the countryside up and down hills and, and hollows and comes to the end of the valley and comes to a refreshing spring or water brook and he just fills his hide full of the life-giving, thirst-quenching water. David said, I'm that way about God's Word. I'm that way, I soak it up. I just can't get enough of it. I'm hungering and thirsting after righteousness. Is that our attitude? Are we hungering and thirsting after righteousness? Is our hunger and thirsting ever fully quenched and satisfied? We just want more and more. But when we drink of the water of life freely, we'll never thirst spiritually, you see, because that satisfies. It's not like drinking literal water, but we just keep wanting to know more about God's Word, and it's satisfying and gratifying, and we want to share it with others because we're, we're filled up. Our cup is running over, you see. And if your cup's running over, like the psalmist David said in Psalm 23, then it's because you're keeping it filled up all the time, you see, because it won't run over unless we fill it up, and we fill it up by reading and studying the Bible and praying to God to help us to grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and Him crucified. That's such a wonderful thing. You know, the Bible is an amazing book. It's the greatest book that's ever been written. It contains approximately 3,566,480 letters, 773,746 words, 1,189 chapters, 66 books, 31,102 verses, and 39 Old Testament books and 27 New Testament books, a total of 66 books in the entire Bible. In point of length, the average word in the Bible contains fewer or less than five simple letters. What a lesson for the man, group of men, or individuals, regardless of their IQ, that had a, a passion for big words. 
The Bible then is a book of simplicity. Let me clarify what I mean by that. Everything you need to know and understand to become a Christian is elementary, A, B, C, easy to understand. Everything you need to know to, to continue to be a faithful Christian and go to heaven when this life is over is elementary. Granted, book of Revelation, book of Hebrews, book of Ezekiel, lots of things that are tough to be understood completely. But we don't have to understand the whole Bible to become a Christian and live the faithful Christian life. We get into Christ, we become a Christian, we're on the inside and we have access to all those great blessings and we just keep growing and growing and growing. And that's what the Christian life is, is a process of growing in the grace and the knowledge of the truth. So studying the Bible, that's important. Believe the Bible. Don't try to doubt the Bible because if you do, that's a tragic mistake now and forever. So believe the Bible, obey the Bible, live by the Bible, and be like the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 9, 27. He said, I keep under my body and bring it into subjection. Lest many means now I preach to others, I myself should be a castaway. So Paul said, I had to practice what I preach. We do too. Whether we're preachers or Christians, we've got to practice what we teach. We've got to live what we teach. Our people will read us like a book, like the newspaper. And if we set the right example, then we can have influence in a positive direction. If we set the wrong example, it's in a negative direction. And we certainly don't want to do that, do we? You know, life is a dressing room for eternity. Isaiah 61, 10 says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord my soul. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness. And as a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorneth herself with her jewels, that's what Isaiah said about it. Are we properly dressed for eternity? Spiritual clothing is what we're talking about. Properly dressed for eternity. And you know, a hundred years from now, it won't matter what kind of house we lived in. It won't matter what kind of car we drove. It won't matter what our bank account was. The thing really that's going to matter is, are we a Christian? Are we ready to die, ready to leave this world? Have we taught people by example and by the Word of God in such a way we can lead them to the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. A soul is more important than everything. What kind of value or price tag you put on a soul? Let Jesus tell us. Matthew 16, 26, What is a man profit? He shall gain the whole world, lose his own soul. Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Matthew 10, 28, Fear not that which is able to destroy the body, but fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. First Timothy 6 and verse 7, we brought nothing in this world. That's zero. And it is certain we can carry nothing out. That's double zero. Zero in, zero out. Let's make sure we read and study our Bibles and make preparation to meet God the very best of our ability while we have the time and while we have the opportunity. Ever wonder what would happen if we treated our Bible like we treat our cell phone? Interesting. What if we carried it around in our purses or pockets? What if we flipped through it several times a day? Most of us do, don't we? What if we turned back to go get it? <laughs> we forgot it. What if we used it to receive messages from the text? We do. And what if we treated it like we couldn't live without it? What if we gave it to kids as gifts. That's the Bible, of course. What if we used it when we travel? What if we used it in case of emergency? This is something to make you and I go, hum, hmm, isn't it? Where is my Bible? Oh, and one more thing. Unlike our cell phone, we don't have to worry about our Bible being disconnected because Jesus has already paid the bill. Wonderful, isn't it? Makes you thop and think, doesn't it? Where are my priorities? And oh, by the way, there are no drop calls. Jesus is always available to answer our questions and to supply all of our needs when we ask him. He certainly is and will. 
take care of our needs. 1 Peter 5, 7 says, Casting all your care. How much? On him, for he careth for you. If we could just get people to understand and put their total confidence in God and not in self, that'd do, a lot, that'd do away with a lot of remedies we have to take to go to sleep every night, wouldn't it? Just turn it over to the Lord and go to sleep. He's up all night anyway. He'll take care of it. He'll take care of it. He'll make sure that it's taken care of in accordance with his will. The Bible is a great, great book. But again, let's notice something. I want to share a little poem with you here. Last eve I passed beside a blacksmith's door, and I heard the anvil ring the vesper chime, when looking in I saw upon the floor old hammers warm with beating years of time. How many anvils have you had, said I, to wire and batter all these hammers so? Why, just one, he said, and then with a twinkling eye, the anvil wears the hammers out, you know. And so I thought the anvil of God's word for ages, skeptics' blows have beat upon. Yet though the noise of falling blows was heard, the anvil is unharmed, and the hammers, they're all gone. Those who hammer away at the Bible, they'll all be gone. Matthew 24, 35. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Mark 13, 31 says essentially the same thing. 1 Peter 1, 22 and 23, seeing that you have purified your souls through obeying the truth, the unfeigned love, love of the brethren, see that you love, the, love one another, pure heart fervently, being born again, now watch it, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible seed, by the word of God, now get this, which liveth and abideth forever. You can't destroy it, you can't do away with it, it's going to be here forever. The best thing to do is to yield to it now while you have the time and opportunity, because time and opportunities are running out, they're disappearing, and they will soon be gone. What are we doing with our time? What are we doing with our lives? Buy the truth and sell it not. Don't compromise it. Yield to it, follow it, obey it, share it with others, because it is the standard that will judge you and I in that last and final day. We've enjoyed so much being with you here on the telecast. Look forward to every week. Be sure to tune in. Listen to us as we preach and proclaim the unsearchable riches of Christ. We love you. We care about you. And we want your soul to be saved eternally. Our time is up. We thank you for years. Until next opportunity we say, goodbye, friends. Once far from God Searching the Scriptures has been brought to you by The Church of Christ. For questions or comments, write Brother James D. MacDonald at 88 Hoover Road, Woodbury, Tennessee, 37190. Join us next Sunday for Searching the Scriptures. Christ liveth in me. Christ liveth in me. Christ liveth in me.